Joel, at least for Christians, the Old Testament is practically synonymous with law. Is that a fair characterization? It's obviously not a fair characterization of the entirety of the Old Testament. But the first five books, the Pentateuch, is not so far off. There's not so much law in Genesis. But the rest of it is, I mean, almost a majority of it is law. It is, Exodus has got some, a some, good chunk in the middle. And then yeah. it's, it feels like law basically from there on out, doesn't it? Now, in, in Jewish tradition, this would be called Torah. Mm -hmm. Is Torah the same thing as law? It's not quite. Though it's not so far off. I mean, Torah, it, it means something like instruction. Yeah. Uh, instruction or teaching. Uh, traditionally, though, that's, it has been understood as, as law. Although, you know, the real issue is, what do we mean in English even when we say law? Oh, right. Um, yeah. Certainly <clears throat> for the, you know, for, for <clears throat> Jewish tradition, and I think Christian picking up on this, these are the books that contain the divine instruction. Uh, these, and, and, they're, and they're exclusively mm. contained in, in these books, in uh, a little chunk of, of Exodus and then in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These are the only places where we have God giving law directly to the Israelites through Moses. And Moses is the only one in all of the Bible who gets law from God this way. Yeah, which is remarkable enough because in most of the ancient world it would have been the king. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, one of the other remarkable things about it is that God doesn't get it all right the first time. Or the second got, time. Or the second <laughs> time. So we have, in effect, I suppose, what, four corpora of law? That's I mean, fair enough characterization? Uh, you've got, so you've got the, 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 what we call the covenant code yeah. in Exodus 21 through 23, roughly. Uh, and then you've got uh, the sort of mass of priestly uh, law in Leviticus, uh, uh, mostly, and then into Numbers as well. Uh, which could probably be subdivided into, into a couple of different categories. Uh, there's sacrificial yeah. law uh, in the first half of Leviticus. Yeah. There's not sacrificial law that comes, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's this, whole, this whole ritual instructions, which is where everyone's eyes glaze over uh, in the first part of Leviticus. How do you cut up the animal and splash its yeah. blood around? And then there's the more interesting things, like how do you behave towards other people? Uh, and then Deuteronomy uh, is, has, contains another big chunk of law, mostly in chapters 12 through 26, 28 in there. And within Leviticus, we usually distinguish the holiness code, as we will a little bit later on, um, which again is, has a lot in common with the rest of Leviticus, but has its own, a few quirks of its own. Yeah. Now, um, but one of the, uh, the things that may bother people if they happen to notice is that sometimes laws change. So that you get revision. Uh, the one that comes to my mind is about slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, who gets to go free after, after seven years? Mm -hmm. And uh, do, do women or do they not? Mm -hmm. And uh, that there you have some changes like that also in how you cook the Passover yep. meal, I believe, where you can't possibly do it both ways. Yeah, I, the Passover meal uh, is I, it's one of my favorites, uh, my favorite moments in maybe the entire Bible because it's such a great example of the thing. Uh, in Deuteronomy it says um, you boil it, that's how you, how you cook the meat, which was just sort of the standard mode of, of cooking, especially yeah. sacrificial meat. Um, you boil it, and then when you, but when you read in Exodus where it talks about how to prepare it, it says, it says explicitly, you may not boil it, you must roast it in fire. What, what's, a, what's a good uh, Passover observer supposed to do? But then in one of the later books, I think it's in Chronicles, mm -hmm. they actually say you must roast, what is it? You must boil, Bo it, boil it in fire. In fire. Yes. According to the law. <laughs> right? And uh, try to have it both ways. Right, but you, uh, but you can Have you ever tried to do that? No. <laughs> uh, but you, you, I mean, here you can see, you can see even within the biblical corpus itself, you can see texts mm. trying to grapple with the fact that you've got contradictory laws. And it's one thing for a story to be told a different way here and there. You don't have to practice a story. Yeah. But once it's understood that these laws are meant to sort of guide the way you behave and the way you sacrifice and the way that you uh, prepare your food, you got to figure out a way to, to read them together. We don't have to figure out how to read them together. But our point is simply to say, 
there's issues here. There are, there are laws that are yes. repeated multiple times the same, right? You sh don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. That law appears three times in the, in the Pentateuch. One, it, one might have sufficed. <laughs> it might have, but at least uh, they don't change it. Right. You know, they don't say one of the times you shall boil <laughs> right. a kid in its yeah. mother's milk. Now, uh, our colleague Chris Hayes has a theory about this, that this is the difference between biblical law and Greek law. Now, whether she's right on Greek law is a whole other question. We won't even concern ourselves with that. Uh, is biblical law supposed to be changeable? I mean, so part of the issue is whether biblical law is supposed to be even prescriptive, yeah. right? Is, is it really supposed to be telling us exactly what you're supposed to do going forward? I mean, parts of it, I think, probably are. But, yeah. but, but in a sense, and, and we know this um, largely from, from having read legal texts from outside the Bible, mm -hmm. very often sort of the category of, of law in the ancient Near East especially was less about providing a guidelines for how to live one's life and, you know, or, or providing a, a law code for judges or lawyers to consult to know yeah. what was right or wrong. It was more about sort of impressing the power of the deity or uh, establish, you know, the, associating the deity or the king with this notion of justice. Um, and uh, we, we talked just a moment ago about biblical laws revising each other but they're not just revising each other, they're also responding to and interacting with this much broader ancient Near Eastern corpus of legal material. Yes, and now how it relates to that broader corpus is also uh, a question. Mm -hmm. There's a, a good book some years back by David Wright, Inventing God's Law, where he argued that Jewish scribes looked at the code of Hammurabi and adapted it. And uh, I must say, I found it quite persuasive. I didn't know if, uh, Part, parts yeah. of it are hard to get around. I mean, there are yeah. some almost <laughs> verbatim yeah. uh, copying going on, but not just copying of one law, but of a whole sequence of laws, and that's pretty suggestive. Uh, there are some laws that we find in the Bible that are famously found in multiple other ancient Near Eastern law codes. The law of yeah. the goring ox, right? What happens if, you've got, if an ox gores a person uh, what happens to it? And if it's no, if it, hap if it happens again, right, the ox has to die and you also, the owner, are responsible in a, in a different way. That's a law that we see in the biblical text yeah. in Exodus and a thousand years earlier uh, in, in, in Mesopotamian law codes. Yeah. Now, of course, when you see that, and for anybody who studies the Bible critically in any case, you get a very different account of how divine law originates. Obviously, it does not come down in a thundercloud on Mount Sinai. It's something that scribes work out using precedents. And to a great degree, what you have here is a collection of precedents that will be adapted and used in different ways then as you go along. You do get some cases where they expressly change a law. Mm -hmm. We mentioned uh, a couple of them already. And now, do they supersede the old law? So this is... It's such a great question because it yeah. depends sort of at the, which moment in time you're thinking about and, and what audience you're thinking about. In our Pentateuch, in our biblical text, they can't possibly supersede. They're all right there. Yeah. Um, were they intended to supersede when they were written? If we understand that these law codes were written in different times yeah. by different scribal uh, <clears throat> communities, sometimes in explicit reaction to each other. So the law of Deuteronomy, for example, is almost overtly a rewriting of the covenant code from Exodus. Again, verbatim yeah. uh, copying of some cases, very explicit changes in, in some other cases. So was the author of the Deuteronomic code thinking I am writing this to supersede the covenant code? I think probably. Yeah. Once it all is, once it's all before us in our Bible, I'm not sure that it can. I'm not sure that it can supersede, which is what creates the interpretive challenge that certainly Jewish communities, uh, but I think every reader has been grappling with ever since, which is 
this and this both have to, are both here in our, in our biblical text. So now, how do you cook your Passover meal? What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, according to the law, is, is, is my answer. Uh, but I mean, <coughs> so the, I think that when we, <laughs> when we talk about um, and sort of the, the broad category of biblical law, it's useful from our sort of academic critical perspective mm -hmm. to remember that what we're looking at is, uh, as you said, maybe not a, a record, uh, a, you know, a transcription of divinely given um, speeches, although I suppose God has every right to change God's mind, you know, also. Yeah. Um, uh, but we're really looking at some sort of a, an, an ancient Israelite broader discourse about um, not only about things like ritual and, uh, and sacrifice in, in many cases, but also about you know, what, what makes us Israelite. Right? Law codes very often have a lot to do with sort of identity building. Um, this, is, this is who we think we are, this, and, and this is who we think our God wants us to be. So, you know, you're, you're sort of the expert on the, the biblical ethics and, uh, and, that's, and, and, and values. Surely you see some of that playing out in the, in the law codes. Oh, so absolutely. And in fact, the process that you see within the Bible continues. Then in the second temple period, down close to New Testament times, we have the temple scroll, which again rewrites certain mm -hmm. laws. It's been a dispute. Did anybody think they could write scripture? Well, yeah, I think they did. Or, they did, they, or did they think that they were writing something that belongs in the category of scripture <coughs> at all? Yeah. Yeah. They may not have quite pulled it off in the end, but they tried. It was still going on. Now, in the, the kind of classic discussion of biblical law, people have distinguished between apodictic laws and casuistic laws. The apodictic laws are things like thou shalt not kill, mm -hmm. which have a tremendously absolute sound to them. Yeah. What do we, well, what, two questions about them. Where do those laws come from? You can make, it's much easier to see where all the case laws come from. These are cases that come up. These are general principles. Where would you have had those? Did they have a setting in life in the ancient world? Uh, so there's been lots of theory about this, especially in the middle half of the 20th century. It was when this, this really, um, this conversation got yeah. started. <clears throat> I'm, I must say, I'm not super convinced that we can pin down, uh, you know, a particular time and place socially where, where one might have seen these kinds of laws. It's fair enough, I suppose, to say that case laws, as you said, might come, at least as a sort of genre, a literary genre, yeah. would come from, um, you know, from, from actual sort of judicial decisions, whereas the apodictic laws, you shall not do whatever, sound to our ears, and maybe it's just because it sounds like, because we're used to them from the Ten Commandments, sound to our ears like uh, these may be sort of more from on high kinds of, uh, kinds of things. I don't know whether you'd want to put them in the, in the sort of a, a temple setting or even a royal setting. Yeah. I mean, anybody with power could say, here's what I, what I think should and shouldn't happen. Yeah. Are they tantamount to natural law? No, I, I mean, I wouldn't say, you wouldn't even ask that question for all of them. Right. Nobody's going to say that the Sabbath is natural law. I'm sure well, some people have tried. Have tried. I, I mean, so, you know, natural, yeah. law, natural law isn't yeah. an inherent, isn't a native category yeah. uh, to, the, to, the, to ancient Israel or to, or to the yeah. Hebrew Bible. I think, that, I think that there is, I think there's a category of, natural, of something like natural law in the Bible, but I don't think any of our law codes fall into it. Uh, I think that if there's anything yeah. like that, it's knowledge of good and evil uh, back in Genesis, back in Genesis yeah. 2 and 3. Um, these laws all basically fall, are, are, are specific to the community that they belong to. Now, Not yeah. that there are communities that say we should kill. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think natural law, the attempt to turn this law into natural law is, I think, an attempt to sort of shoehorn uh, Near Eastern ideas into essentially Greek ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, uh, of course, even 
you'd have probably the, the parade example of what people have tried to take as a, as a basic natural law, thou shalt not kill. But that's even a mistranslation. It is. Right. It really should be thou shalt not murder. Yep. And murder means killing without permission. Yep. Because if you do murder, if you do kill, the penalty is somebody else will kill you. And you've got this going back all the way to Noah in, uh, in the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the death penalty is simply all over the place. Yeah. In the, uh, right. Yeah, Kill, killing is, is certainly yeah. a totally okay thing. Uh, and it's murder that's, that's the problem. Um, I thought, let, let's just look at a couple of the case laws to just to get uh, a flavor of the kind of thing. And the one I thought we might look at, because it comes up for other reasons as well, well, one of them does. Uh, let's start with, with Exodus chapter 21, verse 20. When a slave order strikes a, a, a male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies immediately, the owner shall be punished. But if the slave survives a day or two, there is no punishment. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one of these laws that strikes me as having been the result of some lobbying. <laughs> you know, that there's uh, another one is uh, how much should a man have to pay if he injures somebody else's slave or, mm -hmm. or somebody belonging to him. And uh, in one formulation, it's paying as much as the man demands, mm -hmm. as the husband demands, and then it's whatever the judges decide. Mm -hmm. So obviously you have to you know, curtail this a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we see, we see, and we see this all over the place. Again, not just within the Bible, but I, when I think maybe the most famous biblical law is eye for an eye. Yeah. Right. Uh, with the lex talionis. Right. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Mm. But that law itself, again, is, is one of the ones that shows up multiple times in ancient Near Eastern law codes. Mm. But in most of the ancient Near Eastern law codes, including the law of Hammurabi, I think. When that law shows up, it's not actually eye for an eye. It's you pay the value of an okay. eye for an eye. So, I mean, we see these law codes interacting with, the, with each other and sort of negotiating um, with each community sort of what's most, uh, what's most effective, what's most reasonable, uh, responding to one another. It's, it's, a, it's a process, right, rather than a, uh, rather than a monolith. But, right. Um, the, the other one that comes right after this when people are fighting and injure a pregnant woman and there is a miscarriage, mm -hmm. which becomes famous because it comes, it's the, the biblical text that gets cited as a base text for discussing abortion, mm -hmm. even though it isn't abortion at all. Right. But I suppose the fact that it gets discussed that way uh, is in keeping with the way this tradition develops. Yeah, but it's uh, the, <coughs> the notion that biblical law, and I think probably we can sort of put a, put a pin in it here, but yeah. the notion that biblical law was a sort of given at one time to be valid for all time is not true to the interpretive history and isn't true to the biblical history itself either. That is, even within the Bible, you know, you see this, the, the, the rehashing out of, of these things uh, in, in various laws, in later texts that are trying to make sense of the laws, even within the Bible. And, uh, and certainly in, in the long tradition of interpretation that comes after it. It's, it's about process, right, um, of, of negotiation and interpretation, not about one thing lasting forever. 